Hello, Black Swamp Podcast listeners. Tim here again. Thanks for tuning into episode 29 in our series of BSP Artist and Educator interviews. If you've been listening regularly, thank you. And hopefully you've enjoyed eavesdropping on these conversations. Uh, One of my favorite parts of hosting these interviews is not only getting to know some of our closest supporters more, but also unpacking something I didn't know before and piecing together some common threads connecting both guests and topics. If you're new to our series, thanks for joining us and feel free to travel back in time through our episodes and discover these threads, including improvisation, uh, traveling, and being an entrepreneur, which is a main topic of today's conversation. Uh, Before we get there, I do have a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, We just launched our 2021 Percussion Ensemble Showcase, uh, and to help promote safe rehearsing and recording practices, we've limited the high school ensemble category to a single division, which is two to seven performers only. Plus, we've officially added the snare drum solo category to the annual competition. Yay! This category proved to be very popular last spring after the pandemic shut schools and universities down. Uh, We're also continuing with the college multi-percussion solo division, so there's a little bit for everybody. Full details can be found on our website, also linked in the show notes, uh, which includes entry requirements, deadlines, and 2021 prizes. So have fun and stay safe. Um, This latest episode features BSP educator Donnie Johns. Besides keeping an active teaching and performing schedule in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, Donnie also coordinates both the DMV Percussion and Music Academy. I initially reached out to Donnie to talk about a short article he wrote for PAS last fall about percussionists being entrepreneurs. Uh, What I loved about the article is that although it was very short, it had a ton of great content which Donnie and I unpacked. Again, this is a topic that has come up several times over the last year with other guests, so it was nice to really dig into some more specific thoughts than hear Donnie's perspective and insight, which does start with a compliment, so that always feels good. I listened to some of y'all's previous um, podcasts, and um, it's been really cool. It's really cool to um, check out the different topics you all have been discussing kind of in and around percussion. It's really, you guys do a really great job with it. Yeah, I appreciate it. And what um, what I'd really like to talk about with you today, I mean, first get a little bit of intro, like kind of some of your background. Um, sure. But it's the article that you had in PS uh, uh-huh. Magazine or online recently, yeah. because it's pretty interesting. Several of our last episodes have kind of dealt with entrepreneurship. And I always, yeah. I always slaughter that word. So I, you entrepreneurism. Can, you know, you know look. Yeah, yeah. Being a professional, I guess, professional percussionist and musician. So, and and I saw that article pop up um, in October, I think October nineteenth yeah. when it was released. I only remember that because that's my anniversary. So I oh happy anniversary. <laughs> well, yeah, in October. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, so I thought it'd be cool to to talk about that, and sure. um, you got other things going on, obviously, um, professionally and personally so we can touch on those things yeah that'd be um, great. Uh, but first if you could just kind of give me a bird's eye view of of how you got started in percussion and how you got to where you are sure sure so i started playing percussion when i was in the second grade i started taking snare drum lessons right at uh, music and arts center um right outside of columbia in maryland which is where i'm from okay i took lessons on snare drum uh, specifically in second and third grade. And then after two years, um, you know, my parents couldn't afford it anymore. But thankfully, at that point, um, I was able to join the school band in fourth grade. Okay. You know, I played, you know, in band through elementary school, fourth and fifth grade, middle school, high school. Um, and then joining the, my high school drum line is when I really started to get kind of serious about pursuing percussion, doing both the drum line and the percussion ensemble. Um, is when I really started to get into um, playing percussion and potentially seeing it as a career option. Yeah. So I went to uh, University of Maryland, did my undergrad there in music education. And then I got out and I taught full time in the schools. I taught here in Prince George's County, Maryland, in DC. I did band and orchestra while I also freelance as a percussionist. 
and kind of developed that. Went back to Maryland a few years after that and got my master's in percussion performance and taught a little bit after that. And then in 2015, after teaching for 10 years and freelancing, I decided to step out and um, pursue a career just as a percussionist and kind of build my own entrepreneurial career around that. Yeah. So I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning already. Yeah. Second yeah. grade, like, yeah. like it, normally, like even myself was like, I think fifth grade or whatever, like how, like when I got started playing. So how in second grade did you think you wanted to pick up drumsticks or start playing well, percussion? Well, it's kind of a funny story to be honest with you, you know, um, you know, I grew up, uh, my parents, you know, likes to work very hard and support me and my brother and everybody, but you know, modest income. And so, you know, I wanted to play trumpet. Um, okay. starting off, my dad's like, I can't afford a trumpet, but I can afford these drumsticks. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's right. literally how it started. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <You> know? <laughs> so, um, we start with the lessons and, um, I had a really great teacher, uh, Miss Lisa, um, and she was just very supportive. But at the same time, just took it very serious. And so I always had a very serious approach to percussion um, from a young age. Um, it was always fun, but I always took it serious too. Yeah. So. Were your parents musicians or like, how um, did you well, even decide you wanted to play music, a musical instrument yeah, in general? Yeah. So my, my mom actually, um, my mom used to sing when she was younger and play a little, a little bit of piano. Um, my dad never played an instrument or anything, but my dad's an avid music lover. I mean, he's got one of the largest um sets of albums oh yeah. you know anybody that i know like all his friends and family always want to borrow his he's got a huge <laughs> library of all styles of music so yeah yeah uh, cool uh, do you listen to vinyl at all or no, so you, you know it's interesting i, I kind of want to get into it more you know my dad is always i remember every you know most saturday mornings he'd be in the basement you know working out and, and have you know uh, have have george clinton p funk or <laughs> you know, big into funk and r&b which is what i love now myself yeah, let's get everything but that's definitely R and B soul is definitely the kind of the roots for me. Yeah. Um, no, I just ask because I mean, obviously, vinyls made a huge comeback the last yeah. couple of years, and I, I do have a. I mean, I think I've talked about it on the podcast before. I do have like a small vinyl collection. Um, That's awesome. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I. I mean, I enjoy it. We uh, go like my wife and I are kind of into antiquing or junking. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so you know, I, if ever I see albums. Like we were someplace over the weekend and it was like a little magnet. I just like, like ran over to these albums and start flipping through them and see if I can yeah. find stuff. And a lot of, yeah, kind of seventies, eighties, like back, you know, obviously I collected all the police albums cause I was a huge like Sting and police fan when I was yeah. younger. So Peter Gabriel, um, mm -hmm. Hall and Oates and stuff like that. Oh, Mike, yeah. I, Michael Jackson thriller. Yeah. Like my sister and I used to have, these little battles when we were younger she was a huge duran duran fan and then i was like all about michael jackson thriller stuff so i don't know and we my girls their youngest she loves them she she calls them big cds so she like <laughs> wants to listen to some big cds but yeah it's it's fun. That's really cool man that's really cool man sarah, sarah smile man that's one of my favorite man all in oats man it's a great tune oh yeah um so Okay, so you're in Washington, D.C. area. They're like sort of born and raised and teaching. And yep. that, that, uh, that I grew city. up um, in, in Maryland, um, in Columbia, which is about kind of right in between Baltimore and D.C. Okay, cool. Uh, and around the D.C. area for about the last, about last 10 years or so. Sure. Um, so really kind of my next question to people the last several months has been, you know, COVID era. Like, how's that kind of treating you? And I think this sort of transitions into your article a little bit because mm -hmm. for those who don't know um we'll throw a link to the to your article in um in the show notes basically percussionist is entrepreneur and uh okay so i'm going to talk for a little bit i'll let you talk a, li uh, <laughs> a little <laughs> later <laughs> uh i thought the article was cool because it's really it's short but there's yeah. like really like succinct bullet points in there which i think will, will roll, man, you know what's that <laughs> that's, that's kind of like, how roll, man yeah, direct and to the point yeah yeah <laughs> um but i think there's a lot to kind of expand on and i know you you kind of referenced that i saw you put when you posted it online on facebook you kind of referenced mm -hmm. that like something you want to dig into so yeah um, but at the beginning of the article i mean one of the first things you you say i took some notes here it was uh sorry given the state of the arts economy I'm trying to expand my window here. 
it's becoming yeah. increasingly imperative for musicians to develop savvy and create creative entrepreneurial skills. So this is all kind of coming out of I, when, you know, you and you were writing this COVID era. Is that when you started really kind of piecing this together and, and thinking about it and, and what an entrepreneur and percussionist needs to do? Well, to be honest with you, Tim, it's kind of something I've always wanted to, to really delve into. Like when I first started teaching, um, when I graduated from Maryland, my plan was to always teach in the schools for a handful of years because I saw the importance in that and I wanted to do that for a chunk of my life. Um, but my plan, honestly, was to ultimately always kind of branch out and, and do my own thing. Sure. Um, I've always kind of liked creating my own systems and my own kind of have my own passions and, and think ways that I want to go about doing things. And oftentimes the best way to do it is just to start up for yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but with COVID, it certainly kind of accelerated a lot of that and gave me really an opportunity, speaking from a very, very selfish standpoint. Thank God, me and my family and I have, have been been healthy during this time. But, you know, speaking very selfishly, it's given me the opportunity to have the time to kind of just map out what I want to do with my business, what I want to do ultimately with my career, um, et cetera. So it's, it's allowed me to do a lot of planning. Mm -hmm a lot of sort of inward gazing and a lot of just sort of mapping out with the next short-term goals and as well as long-term goals. Yeah. I, I don't think that's selfish at all. I think that's <laughs> like kind of, I mean, what, you know, as I've been talking to other percussionists and um, the last several months, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. Like that's, if there's a silver lining over the last year, almost like it's being able to kind of reflect and, and maybe shift direction a little bit. I mean, I definitely know some percussionists that have just decided it's not really what they want to do. Like they want to pursue something else or they want to yep. yeah, um, kind of get into or get into a different area of music. So um, I don't know, I think, and then even personally, like I get to spend time with my, my family a little bit more or I get to kind of invest some time and energy there. So yeah, I think it's totally, totally valid. Um, giving you time to kind of, like you said, sort of pivot and kind of prioritize what, what really matters, you know? Yeah. For me, I've always enjoyed various aspects of music and percussion. I love to play. I love to teach. I love to impact work with young people. I love to, you know, kind of draw roots in a community and help to serve a part of, of making my community better than what, what, I, what it was when I came into it. And sure. kind of the bigger picture and so i'm always looking at ways that i can kind of leverage you know some of my my strengths my passions kind of all into one package and so that entrepreneurial route and starting my business and kind of allows me to to take all those things and put them together under one banner you know yeah for sure and before we get into what i considered the first topic of the article which yeah. you've you've just kind of touched on which was multitasking like kind of yeah. having having all these um, kind of skills in one place like mm -hmm. was there someone that uh, either possibly mentored you or that you found as or saw as an inspiration for kind of building a career like this you know that's a great question um I've been gosh I've been blessed to have so many mentors um in in my life um <laughs> I'm hesitant to name drop just only because, <laughs> because inevitably I will leave some out you know yeah yeah, yeah. so um I've had so many great teachers, so many great people in my family, my, my father, my, my, my parents, my aunts and uncles, um, like I said, teachers I've had both musically as well as just outside of music, um, influences in, in my church um, growing up. I mean, I've had a lot of strong male and female um, influences in my life. And so just very grateful for all of those. And yeah. I've pieces from, from many of them kind of inside of music as well as outside of music. No, that's... That's great to hear. I was actually uh, talking to my wife in the last week about um, people of influence, and obviously, yeah. like parents are are one are like sort of the first, the sure. first, yeah, uh, on the front lines. But I mean, you mentioned church. I mean, we're we're involved in our in our church and kind of look to people there, whether it's like sort of a grand parent type influence. I mean, fortunately, my parents are in town, so we have them, but there's other sort of aunt and uncle type figures or yeah. grandparent yeah. figures or just friends of the family yeah. that, that we can be like circles of influence around. And then obviously 
you know, we have friends and we have colleagues and stuff like that. We can all draw inspiration from and, and uh, direction from. So, um, knowledge, you know, and then, and then passing <laughs> that. On. And so it's important, I think, kind of just to, to have those circle of relationships, you know? Yeah. So multitasking. Um, again, you kind of write percussionists need to develop abilities across many instruments and genres. Wait, did I write that? I wrote that. I was summarizing for myself. You, <laughs> <laughs> I was summarizing. So that's nah, good, man. It, it's, yeah. Hey, look, it sounded good. I'll, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So basically percussionists need to build some abilities across, uh, you know, various instruments, obviously, yeah. you know, we're, you know, snare drum, timpani, mallet instruments are kind of the main core, but, you know, Latin instruments, drum set, um, mm -hmm. orchestral drum line, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, different genres. Um, I mean, just like you stated, either Latin or, or orchestral or, or you were really into funk. Uh, yeah. And um, so different styles and we need to kind of transition through those. And so what you wrote was an entrepreneurial struggles honing a craft marketing promoting budgeting forging partnerships uh self-care uh there's some other things in here dealing with challenging personalities yeah. uh rejection like like there's just some cool like stuff in there that you address that i don't think maybe people always consider or or like self-care like okay i don't have time for that you know i gotta i gotta stick to the practice room or you know right. challenging personalities you know maybe i'm the challenging personality <laughs> you know like, right. like so how did um and obviously there's this parallel between being a mm -hmm. percussionist and being an entrepreneur can you can you talk a little bit more sure. about that sure you know i look at it i've always looked at percussionists um People have asked me in the past, you know, why did I choose percussion? Why do I enjoy it so much? For me, um, it's never boring. I feel yeah. like if I played just one instrument, um, I would get bored eventually. Percussion is one of those things where I've said before, it's both readily accessible. In other words, you can put a shaker in someone's hand, they can shake it, and hey, they're playing a percussion instrument. Yeah, but sure. At, but at the same time, it's also kind of inexhaustible in terms of, of just the amount of knowledge that that is inherent in it, right? So in other words, you can be playing for 30, 40 years and be a master in one particular field and still be a complete novice in another field. Yeah. So it's kind of this paradoxical thing where it's it's readily accessible, but it's also something that takes a whole lifetime to master. And so you, you're never bored if you're fully delving into learning more and more about it. And so for me, that's, that's kind of fascinating to me that I enjoy um, always learning new things. I enjoy kind of kind of juggling multiple roles and responsibilities. And um, for me, that kind of, it kind of excites me, you know? Sure. I mean, you, you kind of, alluded to it's natural to be overwhelmed like mm -hmm. by by a lot of these things like how do you address that like if you're talking to your students and i because i assume uh, you know this is part of your what I, I would call a curriculum or like some sort of yeah. part of your your philosophy teaching philosophy like how do you yeah. how do you kind of address some of these issues um and question. not not get overwhelmed it's a good question i think you know to some extent, you have to kind of sort of be wired towards this type of like it's not for everybody, you know. Sure. Yeah, you have to have a certain kind of proclivity or just wiring t towards um, this field, but then also at the same time, um, just being able to prioritize and understand that while the tasks are immense, you don't have to consume it all in one day, right, or in one sure. week, one year, and so being able to kind of you know uh, parse things out into uh, digestible chunks, right? Like understanding kind of putting first things first. This is where organization comes in the key, comes into play, yeah. mapping things out, figuring out what's the, the most important priority now and focusing on that, what's going to be a priority down the road and kind of just mapping things out. But again, it's the fact that there are so many different responsibilities in front of us, it forces you to, to plan and be organized, um, you know, lest you get, you know, toppled over right <laughs> yeah oh yeah for sure I'd, um i i love that you said prioritize because that's a word 
that was kind of my word for 2020 because I had, you know, obviously I, I was talking to lineage percussion several yeah. months ago, students yeah. at Tim Adams. And, you know, part of our conversation was like, there's multiple kind of pandemics. And at that time we were kind of, I felt like we were living through two pandemics. Now I feel like we're living through three or four, you know, you like obviously, um, you know, social issues that are going on, the, the, the actual, um, pandemic you know COVID-19 and then election season and even even now you're in you're in DC less than a week after um, yeah. the events at the Capitol and, and yeah. stuff so it's like I have there's all this information you're trying to to digest and process and then I'm reading I'm researching I'm like trying to like you know look at our read articles uh, watch videos read books and things like and then decide, okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna prioritize this? Because sometimes I feel like I, I have fear of missing out. Like, okay, yeah. I, I gotta watch this or I gotta read this or I gotta learn, you know. So musically, maybe students are like, I gotta learn this, or I gotta read about this, or I gotta work on this piece. And yeah, you mentioned first things first. Is like, are there other ways that you sort of organize or prioritize, you know, what what you're trying to digest or or get through? Well, you know, it's I, I would say it's it's hard in general. And to be honest with you, I I think that as percussionists, we kind of have that wiring that we we want to just be kind of in everything. <laughs> yeah, I, sure. And and honestly, I I think some of that can actually be good. I think most of my percussionist friends are like just a little bit zany, myself included, right? <laughs> Place. And, you know, some of that actually lends itself towards what we do, right? Mm -hmm. But but it's also a matter of, of kind of harnessing those energies and, and, and prioritizing. And look, I'll be the first to say I'm not always the best at it. Yeah. But, but um, that's where I lean on um, friends and colleagues and those that help me kind of organize my thoughts. We'll, I know we'll get into it more later with, with my business. I have associates that, um, you know, I'm kind of like the creative, visionary, you know, ideas, Pop it like popcorn, twenty four seven, and then kind of like, all right, you know, <laughs> right. they help me do that. They help me kind of structure and organize and prioritize and all right. that good. So it's a team effort. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like it reminds me of working at Black Swamp, to be honest, because we're we're a, a, I mean, you know, we're a small company. We all have our different roles, but mm -hmm. yet we sometimes we come together in in our VP of operations, uh, Jamel Taylor. Mm -hmm. he he's like so i mean he heads up production and kind of organizes all that and handles purchasing basically operations and, right but yet he's super creative and has really great kind of marketing ideas and so we uh you know bounce stuff off each other all the time and and sometimes i gotta struggle to keep up like I've, okay i gotta write down okay what did we just talk about like I go back to my office and write this stuff down and then i kind of process it and organize it and what what's viable and what's not, or what do we pursue next yeah. and things like that. And, and, and Nathan, um, uh, you know, same way he, he helps with the podcast, but he's, uh, uh, you know, does our shipping and then put and branding basically. So all of our mm -hmm. online kind of social media presence, and then he's been working on videos too, by the way. Oh really? yeah. I appreciate it. It's been a work in progress for sure. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. So, yeah, it, you kind of, we all have our different seats on the bus, I guess. Right, uh, exactly. But, but we, sometimes we, we all, we talk on the bus. <laughs> so, right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, um, one thing I thought of when I was kind of reading that section of multitasking was, I mean, there's a cliche phrase, jack of all trades and, and sort of master of, of right. none. Like, do you, I, I mean, how do you kind of feel about that? Do you feel like you have to be a master of all trades or you kind of need to be like proficient at everything? Um, I, I think I think inevitably you're going to have areas that you excel in better than others. Sure. Where, you know, you get to a point where if you want to do several things on a high level, you got to just bring other folks in. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, I have, I have skills in, in a variety of areas and, and whatnot, but, you know, I also know that I'm not a master of everything. And so, you know, part of, I believe being a leader is recognizing your 
strengths and weaknesses, and then also recognizing the strengths in others and how you can bring others in to help sort of complement those areas. And so I think eventually it gets to a point where you've got to, you know, depending on what, what you want to do, you've got to bring in a team, you know, yeah. it's beyond just kind of what you can do. But I think on an individual level, it starts with, you know, being a visionary, having an ideas in, in your mind of what you want to do, and then producing a body of work that kind of warrants people's respect and warrants, you know, people's uh, warrants your credibility. Sure. So people want to then come and work alongside you and help build things out even even larger. Yeah. Um, again, I think it's, I guess, kind of our philosophy at at Black Swamp. Like, we we have like a really great team right now and we all have our spots on the bus. It's kind of basically, like right. I said before, like, right. so we all kind of have our focus and then we do overlap and here and there. And we're all kind of, we have our different strengths and weaknesses, uh, which I'm still, <laughs> so I've been working for black swamp for over 20 years and I'm still discovering my weaknesses. Oh, so, a long process. <laughs> um, so kind of the next topic of the article, what I saw was uh, confidence. And yeah. this, this, like when I read this next uh, little quote, I tell, I even tell my kids this, my girl, um, my oldest girl uh, is playing violin and I Ooh. talked to her about playing percussion and you write in the concert percussion setting, every note performed is a solo. Yeah. Uh, we must yeah. have the courage to take initiative and risk embarrassment of having our mistakes expo exposed. Like, I'm like, you're if you're playing triangle or you're playing crash cymbals in an orchestra, there's no hiding. Like, right, exactly. You know, and even though, like, it, you're not the only one playing in the ensemble, you're the only one playing crash cymbals or bass drum or a, a mallet lick or whatever. So, exactly. There's uh, no crash cymbal section. You know? <laughs> no, there isn't. I, no, that's it's not like a drum line, a Margie Man might have one, but that, that's yeah. a whole different thing. Right. And I, I tell my daughter, I'm like, I mean, yeah, you got to practice as playing violin. Obviously, like you, everyone has to be playing together and everyone has to be in tune and mm -hmm. everyone has to be you know, connected like that. But I'm like, man, there'd be days, you know, I don't play, do orchestral work much at all anymore. But when I did, I was playing a lot of triangle and just mm -hmm. standing up and and playing uh, like Mahler or something and mm -hmm. sitting for 20 minutes and then standing up and trying to play a triangle, triangle note or whatever. Like, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's harder than people think, you know? And, yeah. um, like you said, it does, I forgot one of my teachers told me that, and I can't remember which one, who's, which one said it, but yeah, just remember everything you play as a solo, yeah. you know? And so just having the confidence of just putting yourself out there and, and, and taking that risk and, you know, you prepare in your score study and your listing, your preparation, your technical preparation and all that. But when it comes time to do it, you gotta just, gotta just go for it and do it. And you know, you know, the preparation has to be done beforehand. Yeah, but when, sure. when you're in the moment, you gotta just, just go for it. You can't overthink it. You gotta just do it. Yeah. And, and basically you're, what you're talking about in the article is character trait. It's a similar character trait for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and so, I mean, I guess we already just talked about it, but there are some more, some more you wanted to share about that or kind of expand. Well, I mean, I think look in, in the beginning when you're starting a you know business or what have you, you're going to have um, a good deal of naysayers. I mean, look, I told you before, I started, um, I taught in the schools for ten years, doing um, a band and orchestra, elementary, middle school, while I also played, you know, as a freelance percussionist. Um, and then when I left, I left, you know, the, the comfortable kind of, you know, cushy, um, I taught at a charter school in DC, so okay. it was a solid paying position. Um, and then I left that to pursue my own career, not only as a freelance percussionist, but also to start my own, my own business. And, you know, um, <laughs> there were a good deal of naysayers, you know, even people that were very much, you know, like friends of mine, family, yeah. And, you know, so I said, just to say, you know, you're not always going to have all the support that you may have once it's, it's successful. When you're first getting off the ground, it's kind of a, it can be a, it can be a lonely road sometimes, you know, <laughs> Sure. you got to believe in yourself because, you know, a lot of people, you know, the nature of human beings, man, you're not going to get the masses until there's a successful product. Right. And so when you're getting off the ground, it's going to be you, maybe a few faithfuls, but it's going to be mostly you. 
And so you really got to just believe in yourself and believe in your value and believe in what you bring to the table. Yeah. Uh, to be successful. Yeah. Interesting. Do you have any marketing or like business background or is this just sort of, uh, uh, on the job training, um, on the job training, man, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, fly by the seat of my pants person. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm the kind of person, man, I don't know what it is, man. You know, I seem to work better kind of just, you know, um, I don't say I don't plan. I do plan. I do plan and, and prepare and organize, but yeah. it's not when the pressure's on. I kind of just, I do better under pressure almost like when I was in school, like, you know, I would try to, if I had a paper due in two weeks, I would try at times to like, you know, map it out I'm like, a little bit today, a little bit this, and I just couldn't do it. Yeah. But if it was the night before, I would crank that thing out. <laughs> and that's just kind of, you know, I'm just different, man. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah I mean, again, I, I mean, I'll just draw some more parallels to, to, yeah. our, to our job. Like, yeah, we're not, we're all professional percussionists. You know, we, yeah. we, we all the, the team all has music, performance degrees um some of us multiple and you know whatever marketing we've developed is literally just okay me seeing okay what's yamaha doing what's vic firth doing mm-hmm. what's innovative doing like what mm-hmm. you know what do their websites look like what are they what's their convention presence like you know how are they working with artists and educators and then okay how can we do that similarly but also how can we do it differently like yeah and um you know, again, Jamel, Nathan, even the other, the other team members that we have, like Kyle and Junior, we call him. Um, uh, his name's Eric. Like we, we all kind of collaborate on some of this stuff, and um, but then, you know, it was sort of my job <laughs> to figure out, you know, what yeah. we're going to do. So, um, but you know, we have a CFO also that as she's our business sense. So, mm-hmm. like we were talking about before, it's like okay, we have to we got to bring somebody in like we are not master accountants or um, uh, so we need somebody that really kind of knows what they're doing. And that's when we figured out, Oh, there's cost benefit analysis. Oh, there's like, like we're well, yeah. obviously evaluating like what we need to do and how we need to do it. So, um, th- and this kind of leads me to the, like, my curiosity of, of what your experience is, is um, the, kind of third part of your article is about what I considered innovation or creativity. Mm -hmm. And you talk about creating a brand um, and collection of services. Like, is that something you intentionally thought about? It was like, what, um, you know, what's your Donnie John's brand and what you're going to offer? So what's interesting is that that's been sort of crafted as I've kind of gone through my career. Like that wasn't something I had from the beginning, but I, I realized that as, you know, I was developing my career as a professional musician, performer, as an educator, um, kind of helping organize summer camps, even helping um, with different um, uh, instrumental, com- uh, instrumental company and also doing various tasks in, in and around music. I said, well, I'm developing somewhat of a, um, you know, kind of a portfolio of, of, of skills. Right. And so, you know, the more you can kind of present yourself as kind of a one-stop shop, you know, you can get more opportunities to do things. It's, it's actually similar to when I remember when I was an undergrad, you know, our teachers would always tell us, look, you know, most of the gigs around town are going to be drum set, you know, mm-hmm. so you spend your time doing your excerpts, you know, putting that time in, do all that. But if you want to get out here and make money, make sure you have a little bit of drum set skills too, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. So, and so the versatility um, of being a percussionist, you know, there's a direct parallel in that, and especially being in this DC area, there's a lot of work for musicians, but there's a lot of drummers, a lot of percussionists in this town. Sure. And so, and so the more versatile that you are, the more you're going to have opportunities to work. Yeah. You know, I, I, most of my training was classical orchestral. Um, and I play, you know, a good deal of that to this day now, but I also do a lot of church timpani work, a lot of drum set, you know, musical theater, et cetera. Yeah. Um, cause that's been a sort of a thread through a lot of our episodes is, is kind of creating a brand or a, or a sort of identity. Like I look at artists like Matthew Lau or, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Gloria Yahalevsky, um, Anthony D. Bartolo, Josh Jones, like people that have really kind mm-hmm. of, um, even Adam Hopper, he's one of our concert artists, like yeah. really like kind of defined, uh, uh, 
an identity or like a brand sort of. So I think it's, do you think that's, um, you know, a skill or, or a mindset percussionists should have going into this? I I think so. And even more now than ever with the era of of social media and, you know, like you said, you can create your own brand without really needing, you know, a a company or a brand advisors or what have you, you can really kind of yourself. And we have a lot of good models for that. Um, both in it, in and outside of music, right. um, and I and I'll say I'll be, I'll be the first to say I'm I'm learning that. Um, you know, I think I'm beginning to learn that with, with my business, the importance of marketing, social media presence, and and posting, and and all those types of things, and the hashtags and all that. Kind of stuff. <laughs> right. it's, definitely, it's definitely important. That, you know, we're in that kind of new wave now where we can, as the individual, can control kind of our. Um, our impact, our influence. Sure. Um, so before we um, kind of get into some more of your specific activities or what your your branded business are, like, is there anything regarding the article? Like any other kind of things that have come up over the last couple months that you would have, might have included in it? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I kind of just... <laughs> I don't want to say I threw it together. We're editing this. I didn't <laughs> I'm on the education committee for PAS, and so I have, okay. to, I have to publish, you know, X amount of, you know, whatever. So um, Oliver, who's the chair, hit me up and said, all right, we need an article. So I'm like, all right, you know. So I just kind of start, you know, thoughts I had in my head, kind of put them together. Um, but once I did this, you know, I've gotten a lot of um, feedback from different colleagues, and, it, and it's kind of led me to really think through um, expand this out, you know, in, sure. into ideas because I do think there's a good amount of um, information that that can be spread out. You know, I couple my colleagues who want me to talk to students about, you know, percussion, being a percussionist, entrepreneurship, doing a couple of little, you know, Zoom clinics and things like that. And so um, this article actually has um, given me more opportunities to share these ideas and, and prompted me to, um, you know, expand it more. Yeah. No, I, I, again, like I said at the beginning, it was, it was like all these little nuggets of, of information that I think even, I mean, could give people at least a starting point, like somebody kind of jumping off point. And then, yeah, yeah, if there's more, if you're putting together more content, man, I like, I'd be looking forward to reading it and like kind of helping promote it and push it out there for you too. I will definitely, definitely, um, Thank you up on that. So thank you. Today's episode is brought to you by Prime Phonic, the streaming service designed for classical music. Prime Phonic is here to save classical music for the streaming era. The app features high res audio, radio on demand, curated playlists, and podcasts with famous artists. Times are tough these days, but Prime Phonic pays classical musicians in a fair way, paying per second and not per track. This is a huge deal compared to the other services that only pay artists per song. The app features a massive catalog featuring some of our favorites here at the shop, like John Cage, Steve Reich, Evelyn Glennie, and Ivan Trevino. For a limited time, Black Swamp podcast listeners are getting two months free of Prime Phonic with the exclusive promo code Black Swamp. Visit the link in the show notes, enter the promo code, and you're good to go. Again, that promo code is Black Swamp. All caps and all one word. Prime Phonic, the streaming service designed for classical music. Um, okay, so your your brand or your activities. I know, I mean, this is the first time we've ever spoken uh, <laughs> live, I think, and, and I've and seen each other in person, but we've communicated yeah. a lot in the past because you yeah. have the DMV Percussion Academy like, yes. for several years. Um, can you just talk about that? Sure. So um, I started that organization back in 2017, and we had our first uh, events in the first event in 2018. Um, it started off as a summer percussion workshop for students in grades six through 12. And so kind of talking about what we were talking about before about, you know, percussion being such a vast um field, you know, having so many different styles, so many different cultural aspects, there's just so much in it. Um, I wanted to expose students 
to as many different styles and realms of percussion that, that I can. And so I brought in, um, you know, uh, National Symphony or, or Baltimore Symphony musicians. I brought in drum set players from New York. I brought in a steel pan ensemble, brought in world percussion, you know, uh, a jazz vibraphone, you name it. Um, and, and I was able to expose the kids to just a variety of styles of percussion through clinics and master classes, but then also give the students the interactive experience of playing in percussion ensembles and performing at the end of the week. And um, we started off and it was just very successful. And we, we doubled, we started off in 2018 with 18 kids. Yeah. In 2019, we had, we doubled that. We had 36 kids. Um, and then 2020 COVID, <laughs> we, <laughs> right. we did a virtual um, and that was, that was well attended to, uh, wasn't the same as in person, but virtual and that was enjoyed as well. And over the last year, year and a half, we've expanded into, um, just having more workshops. We're going to look at hopefully having multiple locations this year, or we're getting into more of like the, uh, wellness kind of drumming. Um, so we, right now we're partnering up with some members of the VA to potentially to present, um, drumming kind of as healing or wellness drumming for those suffering from anxiety and depression, PTSD. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, percussion and, and helping people and community, you know, something that's just a very things I'm passionate about. So how can I kind of leverage, you know, my abilities, my network, my experiences into really helping people from a larger scale? Yeah. Um, so regarding the academy and even your other like um, teaching mm -hmm. as I mean, are these topics that you address specifically, like when you're working with students, like divert, you know, diversifying like musically or Absolutely. giving back to your community, like things that you are passionate about. A Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know, what's been really neat. I've been teaching for, for, you know, 15 years or so now. And, you know, you come across students with so many, such a vast variety of, of skill sets and abilities and trying to force students into one kind of narrow path to me is is unrealistic and, and not really doing them the best service. Sure. So, you know, I want to expose them to as many different elements of percussion and show them ways to leverage their natural, their abilities and their strengths. And then if one takes on, takes hold stronger than the others, then pursue that. But I think it's my job, especially with younger students, to expose them to as much as they can, because you never know what's going to spark one student versus the other, right? Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it's kind of like conversations I've had with parents before and about like, like seeing what, what kids are interested in. Like, I know I had one friend that, like had his kids do everything, like play musical instruments, do every sport, do academic stuff, just to kind of see what they were interested in. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, that's not, I, I don't know. I, we don't really push our kids kind of that far. And that's not how I was kind of pushing yeah. anything. We sort of organically found things that we were like, yeah. like, oh, I, you know, I started playing drums when I was in fifth grade or whatever. And then it just kind of stuck because I realized I couldn't dribble a basketball or catch a football <laughs> at all. So, yeah. you know, yeah. and I tried, you know, but, yeah. um, so that's I not, that's what, okay. that's why I think the exposure at a young age is so important because yeah. a lot of times, you know, parents will try to put the pressure on kids before, before the passion is there. Right. And it's right. like, that is, ends up being kind of having a diminished returns because yeah. look, reality of it is if you want to actually have a career in these areas you know the, the pressure is real and, it, and it's it's coming but i think the passion has got to be first, right <laughs> yeah and, i guess you can deal with it better but like exactly. having the passion you can handle the pressure better yeah it's a good point it is and so i don't want to you know i think putting pressure on, on, on an eight-year-old i think it's a little <laughs> maybe a little off right yeah so let, let's just put passion in them first then when they're 18 and yeah. the pressure comes 10 years of passion to fuel them through the pressure, right? Um, so what else do you have besides the Percussion Academy? What else, what else do you have going on that, that's kind of connected to all this? Um, well, so we actually, um, I've actually over the last 
several months through COVID um, amidst the kind of expanding out into other instruments. And so um, we're going to later this, this year actually launch, well, kind of officially launch our, our DMV Music Academy, where I've, I've partnered with other colleagues um, in, in brass um, and in um, woodwinds. And we're going to have a um, basically take this and expand it out into into uh, woodwind and brass instruments as well. Yeah, it's cool. Um, my colleagues, um, Larry Williams and, and then Cheryl Nakiba, um, the three of us have been organizing, kind of expanding this beyond um, just percussion into all instruments and doing doing camps, doing talking about what we're talking about, kind of connecting music to larger life concepts and understanding kind of, I think, really, you know, the, the, the skills you learn through music and the, the confidence you can learn really can transfer into any area of life. We want to really kind of use music as a medium just for kind of just wellness at, um, as a whole, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's really interesting. I mean, where did you kind of pick uh, some of those ideas up from? Well, so so my buddy, um, uh, Larry Williams, um, is a phenomenal French horn player, and he and I have been good friends for the better part of, I don't know, 15, 20 years or so. And so we've always talked about ideas and we've, we've done projects together over the years. And we've always kind of talked about kind of coming together and, and, and building something really large. And so we're, 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 you know, in the beginning stages of putting that together now. So I don't yeah. want to be far ahead of myself, but, but, <laughs> but I'm excited about, about what's to come for sure. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, so the, really the kind of final thing I wanted to specifically ask you about was, and we, I think we touched on a little bit about, you know, the last DMV Academy was obviously online because of the pandemic and COVID. Like, is there anything else from, you know, the last six months that how you've had to adapt or be, get, get more creative because of the, the situation that maybe you would, you will implement more of in the future? Yes. It's a great question. So I'm realizing that this virtual, the, the virtual life is here to stay, you know, so. <laughs> right. So, you know, for, before the mindset was, okay, what can we do to kind of, you know, kind of get through this particular season, but uh, it, it's going to be here and, and, and we should embrace it as such. And so um, one thing that we're looking at doing now, you know, depending on what happens with the vaccines throughout the spring, you know, we're hoping that we can have some version of it in person this summer. Right. Um, that, of course, remains to be seen. But if if we're able to do that, we will of course, you know, be safe, spread out, whatever we have to do, but we'll be, um, if we can be in person, we will be, but we'll also, um, either through live stream, probably through live stream, we will also offer the, uh, the camp online as well at a discounted rate. So the camp consists in a nutshell of a series of clinics, workshops, and the kids also play in a percussion ensemble. So for the kids that, that view it online, they won't be in the percussion ensemble. They'll just have the clinics. And so I'll, you know, do it, offer it at a discounted rate. Yeah, cool. I mean, are there any other kind of more personal, professional development type stuff that you've picked up over the last six months as a result of maybe being quarantined or having to adapt or get creative? Yeah, I think, again, you know, kind of talking about, you know, we have to see our students as, as, entire people like they, we have to we can't devoid the the human element you know these mm-hmm. kids are, are going through um many of them lots of challenges and struggles beyond just you know paradiddles and flams right and so right right you can't make everything about just that i mean i've got some students who um you know for some of my students the some of my older high school students you know their parents are are kind of using them as, as babysitters, even though they're in school online, you know, and I don't yeah. judge, them I don't, you know, some parents have gotten laid off and don't have jobs and money to hire babysitters. Yeah, so yeah. it's the reality. Yep. And so literally for some of my students, you know, I'm sitting there trying to teach rudiments while, while their baby's crying, they're holding a baby. <laughs> it's yeah, like, geez. just the reality of, of what, what we live in. So I, I can't, you know, um, you, you can't ignore that and you have to recognize that's the season in life that which we're in. And so, right. um, being, being not just sympathetic to that, but, but kind of empathetic and, and realizing that, you know, wh- whatever I can be for my students right now is what I need to be. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Uh, like our neighbors across the street are both teachers, educators, and, mm-hmm. and the, the husband I've talked to a couple of times about this, like 
you know, he's teaching in person, but also online. He's like, I have to be super conscious of, of the kids that are at home might be at home, you know, for a reason, either, either they're, you know, maybe their family's concerned about health, but that's the only kind of option that they, they have. And, and, you know, he teaches high school and he says, I know for sure some of those students, high school students are helping younger siblings, yep. you know, do school online. Like it's just, yeah. he goes, so I have to be aware of that and be right. conscious of it and, and right. be as supportive as possible. Um, but the, I, again, I was talking to my wife yesterday about some of this. It, it's interesting. My daughter, all, oldest daughter is in eighth grade. And I don't know why she's thinking about like a career path already. It's kind of come up a couple of times. I'm like, Oh, you got time to figure this out. But she's asked both my wife and I like, what would you have done if my wife's a graphic designer? And obviously I'm kind of in the music industry kind of. Um, and uh, she's like, what would you both have done if you hadn't have gone these directions? And my, my wife actually said, I, I think I would go into, I don't know if it would be like psychology or sociology and it, and now i mean she's like said she's kind of had an interest in it but now more than ever like seeing the effects of the pandemic on on kids on on like we have a a nephew who's been schooling at home the entire semester and just went back in person yeah. it was like super stressful for him obviously like it's you know not only dealing emotionally with uh, the pandemic and being at home and a light, total lifestyle change and life uh, change like then he has to switch gears again and go back and it's like kind of doing a little mind trip on him and you can't blame him so uh, we're gonna have to coming out of this i mean and we're not even seeing the long-term effects of it yet yeah that's exactly what my wife said like what's gonna you know this is short term like what are the long-term effects long-term and effects what i think is going to be imperative is that we just prioritize just connecting with each other, you know, and, sure. and getting like, you know, a lot of times this quarantine has isolated a lot of people, you know, and that led to a lot of, you know, mental challenges as well as physical. And so just understand the need for, for, for genuine, just empathy and, and connection. I don't sound cheesy and corny, but like, seriously, yeah. like connecting with people yeah. and the importance of, of human interaction. Yeah. Um, and, and just that, you know, we, we live this life together and, and really valuing each other and, and valuing um, relationships, you know? Yeah. Well, Donnie, I seriously, like, honestly appreciate like being able to connect with you today. Like the, yeah, the, conver yeah, the conversation uh, has been awesome. I'm glad to kind of see each other in person and yeah, talk yeah. in person finally. <laughs> um, and again, like when we, we said at the beginning, like this has kind of been a, a, a a thread through a lot of our episodes to so to kind of be able to pull it together and, and yeah. have like a, a single conversation about this topic of being a percussionist or musician and entrepreneurship um, has, has been cool. So um, before we kind of sign off, is there any, uh, like where can people find you, contact your information, website, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, please do. So um, thank you. Um, check out uh, DMV Music... Uh, dmvmusicacademy.org uh, again dmvmusicacademy.org for the music academy and then for the percussion academy uh, dmvpercussion.org check out either one of those also we are on um, Instagram Facebook um, our Instagram handle is at dmvpercussion so if you, oh, cool. DMV percussion, you'll see us like follow share we, we appreciate <laughs> yeah it. Cool. Well, yeah, I appreciate the, you taking the time and having a conversation. And um... I really, and I'm not just saying this, I really like what you guys, I mean, your products, A, eh? and then the way you all market the videos online are really cool. And, and this podcast is cool too, because it's, it, again, you guys are looking at beyond just music and looking at percussion as a whole, which is in, a, in the lives of percussionists, but I, I think it's really cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. I, um, yeah, I mean, I've been this really was awesome, man. It's, it's it. Adams is the I, I emailed him, <laughs> I, you know, I was like, that's great, man. Yeah, uh, uh, only Tim, only Tim would just curse to him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's fine. You gotta love Tim, man. You gotta love Tim. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, he we took forever to. I was trying to set that like a uh, a uh, an interview up with him for like six months, like yeah, and just yeah. his schedule is crazy and. Of 
finally we kind of nailed something down and it i just thought it was classic he's he was like had put his son down or he and his wife did but he was like in his office or room like yeah i can't talk really loud man because my son's sleeping I'm like okay do we need to do this some other time oh, it's okay i'm just gonna whisper the whole time like, okay that's fine whatever it works so um, you, you, you take Tim however you can get him, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. So, and he, I mean, when we were talking about kind of mentorship, like he's just, I mean, he's been a mentor to me, like just as a person, as a human being. And like, yeah. um, and, but I know uh, obviously his students and colleagues and just being yeah. in the industry forever. It's like, I, I first amazing. met him. So at Maryland, um, John Tafoya was my, was one of my teachers. And sure. He did a summer percussion workshop there, which actually kind of helped to, I should talk about that, but it kind of um, oh. gave me ideas for my work, for my summer camps. But anyway, I was, at the time I had just graduated undergrad in like 2021, 20, 22. And so I was like, I was the camp gopher. So I was the guy who set up all the equipment and I pick up the artists from the airport and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. So, and that's why I first met Tim, you know, Tim Adams. And so he was super cool. Yeah. Um, we connected and that was about 15 years ago. We still kept in contact, you know, he did it for a couple of years. Um, the camp, and so we still keep in contact, you know, you know yeah. a couple of years, whatever. And so, yeah, no, he, I think I asked him a similar question about like prioritizing or like having, you know, be, you know, I have books, uh, uh, you know, social justice books or Christianity, like, mm -hmm. well, like religion stuff. And I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to read about this, but I want to read about this, but I want to read about that. And yeah, and you know, he was telling me, I mean, I, maybe you heard it. He's like, I read this 8,000 page book, like over a couple months while I was letting my dog out. So like every day he let <laughs> his dog out and fed his dog and then read a little bit of this book. I was like, wow, oh, okay. He's just, yeah, it's a mindset mentality for him. But um, yeah, cool, man. Well, it was great to meet you. And likewise, uh, yeah, let me know what's going on again. If you I mean, if you, if you do write some more articles and it's, I mean, through yeah. PAS, that's cool. But I mean, I always like getting content. I love getting content from our artists and educators. So if there's oh, I'd anything, be, I'd be, I'd be happy to do stuff with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I'll put you on my uh, call list then. I yeah. <laughs> well, sure. Um, cool. All right. Well, thanks, Johnny, man. Have good. a good day and enjoy thanks. your week. I appreciate it. Yep. Talk to you soon. See you later. This has been a BSP production, recorded and produced out of the Black Swamp Percussion Facilities in Zeeland, Michigan. Audio and production assistance by Nathan Coles, intro and outro music by Adam Hopper. Music sprinkled throughout the episode featured Joe W. Moore's composition, Benedictus, performed by the Benedict College Percussion Ensemble, and Tim Adams' performance of his own work, Here We Go Again. Visit the show notes for this episode to follow links to video performances of both pieces.